Tonight we're going to continue our admonitions. The Lord has given another. Tonight's admonition, and you don't want to say amen before you hear the title. The message is out of Egypt into Babylon. And that's what you don't want to do, so there wouldn't be a response to that or shouldn't be if you were listening. We've been giving you certain admonitions for endurance for the past several weeks. And I consider tonight perhaps one of the most important because it addresses itself to one of the gravest dangers that confronts the charismatic Christian. And the reason I'm saying this by way of introduction, you have to see it is a danger because you see, according to the Word of God, the trials and the tribulations will increase. Great judgments upon the earth. We've dealt with that in previous admonitions. This will cause some to fall away. And so, as the trials increase, the temptation to go back to Egypt and its bondage are on out into Babylon and its bondage. We're talking about religious bondage. will become more and more appealing. That is either to return to Egypt or go on to Babylon, will seem very attractive when you're suffering under great trial, tribulation, persecution. And so God, in giving these studies and admonitions about endurance, would not have given this church that unless we need it, as well as those many who get to hear the tapes. And, of course, we put most of these messages on radio broadcast. And so I'm encouraging you not to think tonight that, well, this or that aspect of the message really doesn't apply to me because I believe Faith Assembly has the answer or that I have the answer, meaning you. You're safe and secure. Jesus said, he that endures to the end shall be saved. And you keep in mind, I warned you ahead that the temptation to go back to Egypt or on to Babylon, some form of man's religious bondage that has been raised up in recent times, like shepherdship bondage, as an example. This will seem very attractive to a lot of people. Some have already gone back or gone on into bondage or gone into other forms that we'll mention. And so we're not just getting a message said for the sake of two or three people who are here, but for all of us. For the danger of perhaps repeating myself, remember that right now you may feel comfortable. But when things get pretty hot, and I don't mean just the temperature, some things that you would not even consider today will look awful attractive to you out there in the future. You can rationalize. Well, Faith Assembly doesn't have all the truth, and after all, here's a group of faith ministry that isn't suffering ridicule and persecution and teaches that God heals through the doctors, just like institutional religion. You can start rationalizing things when things really get to going rough for you, where it may mean to do what the law says or what the Bible says, and the choice is obey God and suffer the consequences or take the easy path. Well, you only get about two amens on something like that because now people are looking at the floor and the ceiling and saying, well, could that ever happen? So remember the temptation to do what God doesn't want you to do will increase. Some have already fallen into it. Now, it's interesting as you read the Old Testament, study Old Testament history to see how that Israel, after she was delivered from bondage in Egypt, ended up going right back into bondage in Babylon. Now, in between her two periods of bondage, she enjoyed some time of freedom in the Promised Land, but she didn't appreciate her liberty enough to keep it. So many Christians, charismatic Christians, have not appreciated the liberty God gave them in baptizing them in the Spirit to keep it, and so they've put themselves under some form of bondage, is what we're saying. In fact, Israel actually made a full circle. Do you remember God called Abraham out of Babylonia? Called Chaldea then. But he called Abraham the father of the Hebrew race out of Babylonia, and his descendants, the Israelites, couldn't wait to get back. See, that's where it all began. He brought Abraham out. 
And his spiritual descendants, that is, those of us who are overcomers, will refuse to go back. But people are standing in line to go back into some form of bondage. It amazes you. And some people get offended if you even call what is Babylon, Babylon. There is religious Babylon that you have to avoid today. So Israel ended up going back into bondage. Now, according to 1 Corinthians 10, the apostle Paul says that all that happened to Israel, her sins, her disobedience, as well as her judgments and punishments, are written in Scripture. And he says this in more than one place, by the way, are written in the Scriptures for our instruction so that we don't commit the same mistakes and end up in the same bondage and punishment. For you see, it's not enough to escape the bondage of Egypt, a type of the world and a type of institutional religion, by the way. It's not enough to escape the bondage of Egypt. We have to make sure we don't end up like Israel going back into bondage in Babylon, a slave to the Babylonian religious system's ways and errors and even sins. As I said, God called Abraham out of Babylonia, and the overcomers among his spiritual descendants, the Christians, will refuse to go back. Now, Babylon in Scripture is a type that speaks of false religion, error, sin, wickedness. Have you noticed in reading Scripture how often Babylon is a spiritual type of religious error, false religion, wickedness? Babylon in the Bible speaks of it being the source of the substitution of man's religious ideas and ways for those of God and the confusion that results. That's the lesson of the Tower of Babel. God said after the flood to disperse, be fruitful, multiply, fill up the earth. And they defied God right in His face and said, Oh, let us not be scattered. Let us form a religious corporation. That's your first incorporated religious body. Let's form a religious corporation and build a religious tower that reaches into heaven. This is your first banding together of disobedient man calling himself religious and forming a corporation contrary to what God had said. And you see it on every hand today. As soon as a person gets an ordination, as soon as he says, God's called me to be an evangelist, he immediately and churches the same way, incorporate everything. Totally contrary to the Word of God. And fulfilling the type of disobedient religious Babylon that began to substitute its own ideas and ways for what God said to do. That is a perfect type. That is a scriptural type of what you see on every hand today. And people are so spiritually shallow and thick-headed they can't even see what's obvious. All of these things put in Scripture as an admonition. Babylon is always a religious type of something. Again, she's a religious type of all false religion, not only of substitution of man's ideas for God's, but of false religion, occultism, astrology, magic, sorcery, the religious cults. That's carried over into the New Testament, Revelation 17. There, Babylon is what? The religious harlot, Rome. And then again, we see in Scripture that Babylon is a type or source of wickedness itself, sin and wickedness itself, because there in the vision given to Zechariah chapter 5, you recall when we taught that book how that wickedness was caught up from the earth and taken back to its source. You remember that? How wickedness in the form of a woman was taken back to Babylon, called Shinar there, another name for Babylonia. To be set on what? Her foundation, her seat, our source there in Babylon where it began. Now what we're saying is all of this is put in Scripture so that we don't make the mistake of Israel. And get delivered out of the bondage of Egypt only to end up in the bondage of Babylon. And multitudes are in the bondage of religious Babylonia today. You can call them denominations, institutional religion, or... Some who form their own little groups, extreme manifested sons groups, children of God, you name it. Plus all the things that are in the book, every wind of doctrine, the cults, and so on. Now Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 informs us, he says that Israel, when she reads the scriptures, has a veil over her eyes. To this hour, he says, when she reads the Bible. 
She has a veil over her eyes that God himself will have to remove and will one day. Which is just another way of saying that Israel to this hour rejects the truth and believes the lie. And just like Israel, now remember what he said, when she reads the word, she's got a veil over her eyes. And just like Israel, churches are overflowing. Non-charismatic as well as charismatic churches are overflowing with people that God has delivered them out of the bondage of Egypt. And they're standing in line to go back in bondage to Babylon, some form of man's religious Babylon. As if God had never said, I've said all of this in Scripture, so you don't do that. And he says it more than once. And so Christians, multitudes of them, have this veil over their eyes. Well, how to stay out of Babylon or Egypt? You don't want to go back there. That's the message tonight. That's what we're dealing with. That tells you something about the Scripture's idea of religious bondage, the types, their meanings. There are many more, of course. How to stay out of Babylon? Well, first of all, to stay out, you must recognize there is such a place of religious bondage that you must avoid at all costs because multitudes haven't. You must recognize there is such a place as religious bondage, known as institutional religion, known as all of these cults, known as all of these various groups that profess to be charismatic but don't teach the full gospel and many times teach error. There are many of them. You can call them shepherdship or faith fellowship or whatever. We've got a new denomination now arising of faith churches, and you have to believe, you know, that Jesus died spiritually to be a part of that group. It's that group that has formed it. So we've got another denomination on the scene. All the churches that teach faith can be a part of the fellowship if they teach what they teach. How to stay out of Babylon? You must recognize that that is Babylon. I don't care where it's called faith fellowship, shepherdship, children of God, manifested sons. As soon as man begins to organize it, and generally they incorporate it, that is Babylon. As soon as man touches it, it's Babylon. You have to recognize there is such a place of religious error and the confusion that results when man touches it. We've already told you the Tower of Babel speaks of that. You must recognize there is such a place of low moral and ethical and spiritual standards that just bring them in by the carload because you see these low moral and ethical and spiritual standards are found right within Christendom, often clothed in religious garb that teach the easy way, not discipleship, church membership. Worldliness, carnality, sin, approved. And you find it running from one extreme to the other, all the way from your Pentecostal Church of God, charismatic, non-charismatic churches that actually have so-called Christian rock in their services. Oh, you talk about a low level of spiritual understanding. I think a three-toed sloth. Or a duck-billed platypus would have more spiritual understanding than to bring rock and roll into the church and call it Christian. But so-called Christian rock are where the religious groups approve you going into court to defend your rights because they do that themselves. Worldly dress. And you could just make a list of the low moral standards that we're talking about from that all the way to charismatic groups who are honoring the beauty queens who win their titles by her displaying her sexual, physical charms. wonder what Jesus thinks of that. wonder if she'd pull it all off, you know, like she has to do if Jesus were sitting on the front row. But with their low level of understanding, they probably think, why, well, sure, he would approve of it because they praise God while they display their charms. I mean, after all, no one that has a figure like a broomstick is going to win it. Low level of moral understanding 
And such things as your television, charismatic talk shows with your movie stars and your television stars being brought in in order to enhance the program and honoring and glorifying them. And we could, as I say, make a list. The low level is so attractive to that carnal mind out there in the world. And all you have to do is say, I accept Jesus, and you can become a part of that. You have to realize there is such a place that exists and it's called the church, the 20th century church. And anyone like us who even mentions these things, oh, they're religious fanatics, you see. And of course, the snare is there. The temptation is to go that way and get to partake in all of that and to participate in it and so on. We have to recognize there is such a place where religious Babylon has substituted its own golden calves for the truth of God, the pattern of the church of God. And just like Israel, multitudes are bowing down to the creeds, the golden calves of man. A place where the priests of institutional religion have substituted for the full gospel and the clear word of God their own concoctions they're drugging their followers with in order to get them to bow down to them and follow them. So the reason we mention, first of all, if you want to stay out of Babylon or not go back to Egypt, some are doing both. The reason we mention, first of all, that you must recognize and admit there is such a place of religious bondage is because many, many that God brings out of the bondage of Egypt immediately make application to go back into bondage to some form of man's Babylonish religious system by joining some old dead denominational church or dead charismatic church instead of waiting on the Lord and asking the Spirit to guide them into a spirit-filled, faith-filled, full gospel work they stand in line to be identified with the big system. They don't want to be criticized. And you can have the baptism and speak in tongues now and be in good fellowship in a lot of the systems of man. But they immediately, after they get delivered from bondage, make application to go back into bondage, and the system will rob them immediately of the full gospel and their liberty that he's giving them when he baptizes them in the Spirit in order to bring them into bondage to their religious creeds. You have to recognize there is such a danger. And as I say, as the trials and tribulations increase, and it may get to the place where you'll have to come to church by faith because of the opposition. The temptation is going to be to take the easier way and rationalize it. And so unless you recognize there is such a danger to avoid, the time is coming when, like Israel, you can be ensnared and go back in it, is what we're saying. Oh, how many have we talked to or needed to be prayed for to be delivered from the bondage of the institutional system where spirits actually had their minds bound to the place that even though they knew what you were saying was right about all of this, they were so bound by those denominational, institutional, religious spirits or cult spirits where they worship a picture of a man that it takes deliverance to get their minds free. And some people, as I say, actually get offended if you say the institutional system is Babylon. Now, I'll tell you, it's a mystery to me why a Christian would ever get offended when you expose the presumption of religious man in substituting his own doctrines and creeds and organization and religious practices and ideas for the clear word of God. Why you ought to get offended because they would presume to do that. I'm offended with them. I'm not offended when somebody says that system's Babylon. They have presumed upon the Word of God. God is jealous for His Word. And if you don't feel inwardly in your spirit that same zeal that the prophets had, then we'll just say, you're no prophet. I'll tell you, a man who isn't a prophet wouldn't preach the message tonight. I'm trying to make a point. I didn't, at the same breath, call myself a prophet. That's another story for another time about what God's end time full ministry for me is. But that isn't what I'm trying to say. That's just the way it came out. That nobody but a prophet would preach that institutional religion is Babylon. 
because no one else is doing it. I heard a preacher on the radio this morning while I was eating breakfast, and he was apologizing for the message. And every word was never you. It was always you and I. He had to bring himself into everything, and it sounded good at first. He's humble, but every other sentence. That he was including himself in the sense that he didn't have a revelation of this from the Lord, but he's going to have to examine his own heart too. You know what I'm saying. You should examine your own heart. Is there a place we can put a period here? Some of the looks I'm getting. You know what we're saying. You don't have to get up and tell how humble you are to be humble. But what I'm saying, there was no anointing and no authority. His subject was good and you wanted it to come out right, but I just said, Lord, I just hope, you know, that gets through to people. What he was trying to say. God is jealous for his word, I said. Amen. That its truth, its purity be maintained and not perverted as it has become. What with over 250 babbling tongues of denominational institutional religion. Which can't agree on anything but to disagree. Now God, according to scripture, is not the author of all this religious confusion in the world today. I don't understand people who think the institutional systems of God. He isn't the author of that confusion. And if there's anything that characterizes the religious scene today, it is utter chaos and confusion. We're witnessing once more the Tower of Babel. It's a repetition of the Tower of Babel. Over 250 religious towers being built to heaven and everyone saying, follow me, this is the way, this is the way. That's why we urge you because visitors and spies get in here and say, well, isn't that what you're saying? No, that isn't what we're saying. Why don't you come long enough to see what we're saying? We always say, check it out in the Word. If you can't find it in the Word, you don't want to follow anything but the Word in your conscience. But 250 with their creeds, we don't have a creed here except the Bible. If you want to call that a creed, that's our creed. Building their religious towers up to heaven, saying, follow me, this is the way. And even charismatics, because of all of this emphasis today in the last five to ten years, all of this emphasis upon the purpose of the outpouring of the Spirit is for charismatic renewal of the existing institutional religious system, because all of the emphasis upon charismatic renewal of man's religious system, rather than the outpouring being for the purpose of restoring the New Testament apostolic pattern, that's clearly taught in the Word of God, because of all the emphasis that what God is doing is restoring man's system, then a lot of people that he brought out of bondage see no reason any longer in being concerned about maintaining their freedom and liberty that he gave them. And some are actually going back to Egypt. I know of cases like in one case where he went from charismatic to Methodist and a religious leader. Now I recognize he went out of Pentecostal to Methodist. I recognize that the Pentecostals have become a denomination. That's another subject. But at least it was charismatic. The point is that you give up what purports to be a full gospel, spirit-filled life, and go back into a dead system. Because of all the emphasis upon the fact, well, we all have some light and some truth, and we're all going to the same place, so it doesn't matter what you belong to. I know of a Roman Catholic couple that came out and God used them in a great way, their testimony. And the last I heard, they've gone back into their idolatry, their merry worship, gone back into Catholicism because of the stress today about, well, why should you leave your system? Bloom where you're planted. The charismatic renewal idea. And so many times people do not see that going back to Egypt is going right back into the bondage that God delivered them out of. Another case, I read of a minister that God literally, and I know him because I've ministered with him, God literally, supernaturally, delivered him and his group out of the bondage of the denomination they were in. It was like Indonesia. The Spirit of God just fell on their church. They began to prophesy, speak in tongues, just like in Indonesia. Supernaturally delivered them out and recently, and they're so proud of this, the denomination has given him his ordination papers back and accepted him back in, and he's just all smiles. Why, he ought to say, accepting me back, God forbid. 
How shall we who have been set free from bondage return again? I've read Galatians, he ought to say. Supernaturally. I mean, you can read his book. Supernaturally. Brought them out. And couldn't wait to go back. And thinks it's a privilege. These are leaders I'm talking about. When you see people on every hand going back to Egypt or on to Babylon in this end time, you must guard yourself against this danger because... Ten years ago, they would have said, oh, no, never. Like the Roman Catholic couple, oh, we're so happy to be out of the errors of Catholicism. And now with open eyes, go back into the bondage of Catholicism with its idolatry and mariolatry and its errors of every kind. How can you tell What's of God and what's of man? Well, as I said, if man has had anything to do with establishing it, it's Babylon. I don't apologize for it. It's Babylon. If he even touches it, it's Babylon. Because the Holy Spirit draws to Jesus, according to the New Testament that I read. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. The Holy Spirit regenerates a sinner. The Holy Spirit forms the local assemblies. There is no one of you that we invited to come. Well, we believe if you're supposed to be here, and I've told I don't know how many, when they say I'm coming, going to move here, they don't ask if they can. It occurs to me sometimes, wonder why they never wrote ahead to find out if there's even a seat. But because I'm such a strong believer in the Holy Spirit bringing the ones in He wants, I tell them that. I say, well, I believe that if God wants you here, and this is your place, the Holy Spirit drew you here. Because it's not an easy place to move from California or Georgia or wherever to. It's a place of trial and tribulation. It's a place of blessing. It's a place that's going to be used in this end time mightily of God. Mark it down somewhere. We've said it before, I think. But see, the Holy Spirit draws them together. He's filled up the hundreds and hundreds of seats in this church. We didn't have to devise all of these religious schemes to get people to come. You know, like Sunday school picnics and pack the pew contests. <laughs> and whoever wins it will take them out to Colonel Sanders for a chicken dinner. <laughs> Our beauty queen pageants. Our sweetheart dances on Valentine's Day so the youth will get interested in our work here and have some good old Christian rock. After all, we got to minister to the youth. And on and on. The Holy Spirit filled up these seats. Amen. Amen. And if you don't believe He set you in here, you shouldn't be here. So first of all, in order to avoid going into Babylon or back to Egypt, you have to recognize that these Places, these dangers exist and they become more and more attractive as the end draws closer. Oh, I'll tell you, you don't want to be caught dead in Babylon. Babylon is going down the drain rapidly. You don't want to be caught in Babylon when Jesus comes. And so to stay out of Babylon, secondly, we must Patiently submit, patiently submit to God's present time of preparation. If you want to stay out of religious Babylon, if you want to make sure you don't go back to Egypt, then patiently submit to God's present hour of preparation. Do you realize one of the most difficult tasks that God has with Christians after He delivers them out of Egypt? is to get them to settle down to the discipline of preparation. He never called anybody to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit and meet together and sing songs of praise and then go home or set a white chair out in the middle of the floor and pray for the sick and then go home or give a little talk on Psalm 32 or something. He called you to prepare, to die out to self, to yield yourself to the ministry of the Holy Spirit within you. To get under the discipline of a strong word, a full gospel. To get prepared. So if you want to stay out of Babylon and Egypt, then submit to the discipline of preparation. There's a time of preparation. You won't have it later on. 
And some are not going to be able to find it. They're going to be the five foolish virgins who have no oil in their vessels. Their lights will go out at the time they'll need it the most. And those who prepared themselves, the five wise virgins, you know, they prepared themselves. They got oil in their vessels, not just their lamps. But so many Christians grow impatient when they have to wait on anything, even God. Whether it's waiting for an answer to a prayer, they've claimed something. You know, we dealt with this last time, how they give up because, well, it's been three years and my husband isn't manifested yet, or it's been six months and I still can't see any better, and I threw my glasses away and can't even see to find them. <laughs> and remember, we don't tell anyone to throw the glasses away. I've had them time and again come up here and hand them to me. I just hand them right back. I said, that isn't faith. I said, you do with them what your faith tells you to do. You know, it doesn't do any good to hand them to me. <laughs> do what I did. Just throw them as far as you can or break them. Now, that's your decision. We never tell anyone to get off of medicine. If they ask that, we say, you're not healed yet. Because, well, people don't take medicine. And as soon as you pray for them, they say, should I continue to take my insulin or my pills? Well, my, why are they asking us when they're still sick? I'm no doctor. I don't know how to advise them. All I can do is believe the Word of God. The prayer of faith will heal the sick. Now, if you believe you're healed, why would you be taking pills? Because medicine will make well people sick. This stuff they're dishing out today would make you deathly ill. It does anyway. Think what it would do to a well person. But they can't wait on God to manifest His promises, or they can't wait while they get into the Word of God and sit under teaching and take their notes and listen to the tapes and study and pray and fast and whatever is required until they can mature spiritually and mature in the faith. They can't wait on God to fulfill His end-time purposes. And yet they know that if they plant a garden, they can't partake of it. As soon as they plant the seed, they don't go out and dig up the seed and eat the roots. They have to wait till it matures. They know that. That's a principle in nature. And God abides with the same principle in the spiritual dimension. They don't turn their keys over, these people who are impatient I'm talking about, to their eight-year-old child to drive the car. They wait till he grows. They know they've got to wait a long time. And no boy out there knows he can grow a beard no matter how hard he tries until he waits all of those long years till he can grow up. Some get a little peach fuzz and try to color it with a burnt match. <laughs> Trying to push things when they get about 16 or 17, but they still have to wait. Babies still take nine months before you can enjoy their presence in the home. I mean, that's what babies are for. Even crying ones. And fruit trees, years. I've got apple trees I planted years ago, and they're still little old things. It takes years to enjoy the fruit. He created those laws of nature. He operates on the same spiritual principle in this dimension. Let's use some examples. Take John the Baptist. In Luke 1 and verse 80, we see in these incidents I'm going to give you that God always follows that principle of preparing, and sometimes for a long time, a person before he will use them. Sometimes he'll prepare a person for years to bring a prophecy or message. And so in Luke 180 of John the Baptist, look what he says. And he, John, was in the deserts till the day of his showing in Israel. Now, how long was John in the deserts? How long? At least 30 years, or from the time he was weaned until he was 30 or more. Well, he'd be about 30 because Jesus was 30. And remember, they were born about the same time, John the Baptist and Jesus. Get that 30 years in preparation for a few months, and then ended up beheaded. But God prepares those he uses if you don't want to prepare. My housework keeps me busy, my job, my business, my college education. Or I don't have any part in the body of Christ except I'm a good praiser and I can sing harmony. If you don't want to prepare, God isn't going to use you in this end time. And of Jesus, all of his life, he came forth when he was 30. 
for a 36-month ministry. That's all. Then he said, it's finished. Moses, 80 years in preparation. David, from the time he was anointed king as a youth, spent many, many years before he ever ruled as king. In other words, there was a long time gap between his anointing as king and when he ruled. I suspect if you count up, it would be neighborhood 30, 40 years. He was anointed as king as a shepherd, and Saul ruled for 40 years, and Saul tried to take his life, you know, right after his anointing. Esther, Mordecai said to Esther, you have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. Well, we can assume from what's said of her, she was in her early or late 20s, although in those days she might have been older, we don't know. But all of those years to do what? To deliver Israel from the hand of Haman, wicked Haman. Daniel, 70 years from the time he was carried a youth into Babylonian captivity, Seventy years through his fastings and prayers, he saw Israel delivered. Seventy years? How many people do you know who could wait seventy years to see God fulfill His Word is what we're talking about. We read in Daniel that he said, according to the Scriptures, the prophecy of Jeremiah, I see that Israel, Lord, is to be in captivity seventy years. The time's up began to fast and pray for God to deliver Israel. Seventy years. He knew that was there. He knew it was no use praying for seventy years. Could you wait seventy years? Overcomers are those who develop patient endurance in this time of waiting, in this time of preparation. God's given you time to prepare. God's given you time to get established in what He's going to do, to get established in why you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So overcomers are those who develop patient endurance in their time of preparation, but some cannot wait for God to manifest Himself, fulfill the visions and prophecies, fulfill His promises. So they either go back to Egypt, the institutional system, many have and are. Some actually don't come out. You know, they get one foot out the door. But they can't really get release from their denominational nursemaid that tells them when to go in and out. But anyway, because some are impatient, even waiting on the Lord, they go back to Egypt or they go on into Babylon, the new forms of religious bondage, such as we've mentioned some, the shepherdship denomination. And there are new ones arising all the time, charismatic forms of bondage. Or they make their own golden calves to substitute for the truth. All kinds of golden calves as you can find. There's no point in repeating all their names again, but where Egypt would represent the old dead system, Babylon would represent going out of that bondage into some new form of bondage, like shepherdship being an example. The golden calves are what men are building outside those two forms of bondages, like the extreme manifested sons groups and some others that we could name. They're not really a part of either system, but they're making their own golden calves. You remember in Exodus 32 when Moses was up in Mount Sinai getting a revelation from God for Israel. Then Israel grew impatient and said to Aaron, make us golden calves that they could bow down and worship. And so those who are not true overcomers either go back to Egypt or stay in Egypt, don't really come out, or they go on to some form of Babylonian bondage, or they substitute their own ideas, their own golden calves that they can sing and dance to and bow down to. But many are the promises in the Word of God for those who are willing to patiently wait. Some from this body have not been able to wait. Oh yes, over the years, from 1966 now to 1980, there have been some who couldn't wait, had to rush off and do their own thing, and generally miss God, or got into error, or whatever. But many are the promises in the Scriptures, the Word of God, for those who will patiently wait. Let me give you some. Isaiah 40 and 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Praise God. I mean, that can be applied physically and spiritually, and that's for those who wait for the Lord in this hour. 
The time's coming when we will mount up with wings as eagles. Amen. Now, I mean that in the supernatural sense. You could run from here to California and not grow weary. If God says run, you just start running. <laughs> Feet may never touch the ground. For those who can handle it, I know of a case. Valdez said when his father, now if you don't know Valdez, you're not really into charismatic ministries. He had a tremendous miracle and word of knowledge ministry himself. And he said his father had such an anointing on him when he was like five years old. Talk about walking on water. He said he walked on air. And in his simple faith didn't know that, you know, being a child of God, that this wasn't normal. And as he grew a little older, he got into some of this teaching, listening to people, and he could no longer do it. There are times when water won't be there for you to walk on, and you'll wish you had the faith that he had. You see, you develop faith now. I didn't intend to get off into this, but mounting up with wings as eagles just sort of touched me somewhere in this area of the fact that out there, prepared for those who will wait upon the Lord, are supernatural occurrences. The time can come when, to even save your life, you might have to walk between one tenth story building to another. God can do anything. Again, I'm getting some looks. <laughs> anyway, this happened. Valdez said it happened. Said actually walked on air and his sister saw him walk over the treetops and the housetops. Now, you didn't do that every day. He didn't do it like making clay birds and having them fly. And It isn't the same thing at all. But such an anointing on him and such simple trust in God. And God used his father like he used his son Valdez in tremendous ways. I've seen Valdez minister, and I'll tell you, everybody walks up, he knows exactly what it is. Well, he's dead now, but anyway, that's one of the promises. Here's another one. Psalm 37, 9, for those who wait upon the Lord, evildoers will be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit this earth. I don't know what you've been taught in your old dead church, because most of them are amillennial. They don't believe that... The saints will inherit the earth. Back in my amillennial days before I became premillennial, which is, by the way, what the Bible teaches, one thing that convinced me that the Baptists were wrong in their amillennial position, passages like in Matthew 5, the meek shall inherit the earth. I said, what are we going to do with it? Because we're being taught there's no literal kingdom on this earth to be established. Passages like that. Well, anyway, here's another one. Psalm 37, 9. Some people say, what do I want with the world? Well, when Jesus gets done with it before the millennium starts, you'll wish you had believed that they that wait upon the Lord will inherit this earth. Amen. Hallelujah. And what about all those promises? If you're faithful in a little, he'll make you ruler over ten cities. Well, there are no cities in heaven to rule over. God's ruling up there. Anyway, there are no cities to rule over. There's just one, Jerusalem. And that's coming down. After the millennium, by the way. Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and He will strengthen your heart. In other words, He'll minister to what you need. Isaiah 49, 23. This is God talking. They shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Hallelujah. Because He knows the tendency of the human heart is to get impatient if it has to wait on the manifestation of a healing or wait for a vision or a prophecy to unfold. I had a vision and prophecy 14 years ago. I'm not getting impatient. I just get more anxious as the time passes. I know it's getting closer and closer. It's 14 years closer. Hallelujah. Like the second advent. It's 2,000 years closer than when Jesus said, Watch, I'm coming back. In an hour you think not, I'll be back. Hallelujah. And then we're told in Psalm 40 and verse 1 that God does answer the prayers of those of you who wait for Him, that you endure. Psalm 40 and verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, the psalmist says. Then He inclined unto me and heard my cry. 
But you notice he says, he waited and then God answered him. And look what he did for him. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. I don't care how big your trial is or how deep you are in the pit. Don't despair. Just wait upon the Lord because he's still there. And he said, I will answer those who patiently wait for me. Go, my servant, and tell them that this is true, that those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They will not be ashamed. Some people got ashamed waiting for a manifestation, so they went back to the doctor. They couldn't stand the ridicule at the office or at home or whatever. Some people can't wait upon God. They grow impatient, we're saying, for Him to fulfill visions and prophecies and things they've been hearing for years. We dealt with this somewhat last week from a little different perspective last time in the message. But how many people do you know who have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Right now, maybe they received it three years ago, five, ten. How many people do you personally know who have the same zeal and expectation for the Lord to just come breaking into our history in a supernatural way? How many that had the baptism do you know who still have the same zeal? You know, when they got the baptism, like you, they ran to all the full gospel meetings, went to faith seminars, charismatic camps, sing and praise sessions, sit up all night just singing these little courses. How many do you know who don't have that zeal and they've gone back? They're confessing the negative. They're back to making the rounds of the doctor's offices and the banks, complaining. And you wouldn't know they were a Christian, let alone a charismatic one from their looks and their testimony. How many do you know? Maybe I'm talking to you who have the zeal they had. I'll tell you, I've got it. I live on the edge of expectation. Oh, I've mellowed and matured, but I haven't lost my zeal. Oh, it might surprise some of you how many times I say, thank God for this anointing to teach your word. But I know the promises out there. Now, he said some things to me that he said, don't even tell your wife. I asked him if I could tell her. He said, don't tell anybody because even to speak what he said to me once. Some of you would stumble because I've heard you say things that I know you would stumble. You just couldn't handle it. But when it happens, you'll have to handle it. So what I was saying, it would surprise you how many times I say, thank you, Lord, for this anointed word. I know they need the word more than they need to see miracles and walking on water or whatever. Because the Word is what He's interested in, because He's the Word, and He has to get you prepared. America won't prepare you. It'll confirm what somebody says from the Lord, but that's all. America won't prepare. It'll entertain you, but it won't prepare you. Now I say, thank you for this anointing to teach your Word, as He's given me, you know, for the past few years. But I said, Lord, oh, you know the time. Your timing's best. But I said, I still confess what you told me, that I'll possess it. And I said, your timing is best, but oh, how my heart yearns for you to part that veil and it begin to happen. It's supernatural when it happens. So I haven't lost my zeal. You see, there's a different kind of anointing. When I used to travel all over, you know, we were seldom at Faith Assembly because God had us out getting exposure of this message. And you see these tremendous, wonderful things happening in your meetings, you know, blind eyes open. But you see, He sent us here. Not that we haven't seen that. You've been here when it took two or three up here to catch the people who would fall to the floor because the power of God was being manifested. And one night, 20 or 30 healed instantly of infection. So He does that. That isn't what I'm saying. But you can go to almost any charismatic meeting and see a miracle. Just believe for one. 
But he set us in here as a time of preparation to get established in his truth. But I haven't lost my zeal for the other, even though, you see, we don't always say, well, the gifts of healing are operating tonight. Everyone believes come. Now, when that happens, God has a purpose, and occasionally it happens. But you don't need to see that to believe. 99% of you. If you do, you're not yet mature. And there's a time when all of you put together what you've seen will just be a drop in the bucket. Amen. Praise God. I have the faith for faith assembly. I don't know if faith assembly has it, but faith assembly is going to be an instrument in the hands of God in this end time if we can get them settled down to preparation. That's why he's giving us time. He isn't delaying just to delay. He's giving us time to get established in the truth. He's giving us time to get free of all of those forms of religious bondage that we picked up from man's system. And every one of you, since most were in some form of the religious system, every one of you still have things God has to root out. Pull out root and branch. Say, Lord, pull them out, root and branch. Those precious little things that are so dear to me. If you find yourself getting offended because we come down hard on religious Babylon, you need deliverance. It isn't our problem. You should be offended because there is such a thing as religious Babylon. <laughs> is such a place of bondage. And so praise the Lord, I haven't lost my zeal. I said, how many do you know? Maybe you're one of them. That you're not where you were. How many do you know who heard the faith message? Who heard the charismatic message? Who heard the message, the end time message of Gideon's army, what God is doing? It's a time of preparation for great end time ministry. How many who heard that message still are walking with it and in it? But how many, on the other hand, do you know who say, that seems like so long ago. I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit five years ago or ten years ago. I got it back in the outpouring in the 50s when it first started, that is, in the churches. It started in 1900. How many do you know who say, well, I've been sitting here for five years or ten years or whatever. I've never had anything spectacular, supernatural happen in my life. I haven't even had a vision or a prophecy or whatever. And because of that, they've lost their interest in waiting upon the Lord. Oh, I'll tell you, friends, one of the hardest things to do is to get the human heart to settle down and wait in a time of preparation. Not just waiting, you should be preparing. And I want to tell you that people who are giving up and saying, well, what's the use? Nothing has really happened in my life, at least nothing spectacular. I'd like for you to turn over to Habakkuk. I could quote it, but I want you to see it. Habakkuk chapter 2. Now listen to me before we read that verse. God's prophetic word to this end time generation of overcomers is still the same word that he spoke through one of the last prophets of the Old Testament, Habakkuk. This is still his word to us and the principle to follow. Habakkuk 2 and verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. All these visions and prophecies, where is their fulfillment? People are saying as they get impatient. God says the vision is yet for the appointed time. And at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come. That's God's word in this hour. Amen. Though it tarry, wait. You know why God said that? Because he knows the tendency of the human heart to grow impatient if it has to wait for anything. And people, they'll either go back to Egypt or on to some form of Babylonish bondage, or they'll start making their own golden calves, establishing their own ideas because they can't wait. They've got to get things moving. Like Israel said to Aaron, Arise and make us gods of gold. As for this man Moses, we know not what has become of him. They said that after they waited all of 40 days. Less than a month and a half. As for this man Moses, he went up to get a revelation. Where's the revelation? He said he's going to come and give us a revelation from God. As for this man Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. Arise, make us gods that we can sing and dance to and bow down before. That's man's heart. 
God said, wait, though it tarry, wait. They couldn't wait. King Saul, you remember, couldn't wait on the priest Samuel to come and make the sacrifice. He usurped the office of priest, which was forbidden for the kingship and the priesthood ever to come together, except in Christ Jesus. And so he usurped the office of priest because he couldn't wait. And there are just multitudes of charismatic Christians that can't wait. They've heard the visions. They had the zeal at first. They saw the healings. They saw the miracles. They had, many of them themselves, the visions. They heard the prophecies from God's prophets, as well as some who weren't prophets, but he anointed them to prophesy. They've grown impatient. The zeal has worn off. Some went back into Egypt. Some of the leaders, I mentioned some. There are many who have gone back to Egypt. And others who just immediately make application to get into some form of religious Babylon. They're standing in line to do that. And others are making their own golden calves. Some of them gave the prophecies. Some of them related the visions. But now you see on every hand charismatics falling into the same snare of the devil, growing tired of waiting on the Lord to fulfill his promises. And so they're establishing religious organizations on every hand, building Bible schools and colleges and all sorts of institutions patterned right after the old dead institutional system. From its cap and gown ceremonies, which what in the world does that have to do with teaching people to preach the gospel? Cap and gown ceremonies to million dollar dormitories to house students in to teach some church music and some of the doctrines of the denominations along with your charismatic truths on healing and so forth and many times not even what the Bible says. Their own golden calves. God said the vision may tarry but you wait for it. You see the present delay does not mean things have changed. I'm not going back on the visions and prophecies that I've heard. And what the Lord has shown me, or said to me, I'm not going back on it. The present delay, as we've said, is to get you established in the truth. Amen. To give you time to get free of all your forms of religious bondage, doctrines in your head and in your spirit. Because that's all you've seen, that's all you've heard, is the contemporary confusion of the religious scene. God's giving you time. Overcomers are not like these we've been talking about who are always looking for something new and if it doesn't happen they give up. We're not looking for anything new. Overcomers are not. We found what we wanted when we got baptized in the Spirit. We knew there was something missing. Well, of course we found what we wanted when we found Christ, but these people have Christ for the most part. That isn't what we're talking about. So we're not searching for anything. Thirdly, if you want to stay out of Babylon or avoid going back to Egypt, then you must separate yourself completely from these roads that lead to Egypt and Babylon and get on the right highway. And that's the highway, oh, you guessed it, faith. Very few walk in there, friends. Holiness, fewer still. Truth. Or we could just say the highway of the full gospel. But I think basically it's holiness, Faith and truth. Get off of the roads that will take you back to Egypt. You get off the faith walk, you'll end up in Egypt or Babylon. Hundreds of thousands have. So why do you say, well, it couldn't happen to me. It happened to them. The Bible speaks of a highway of holiness into the kingdom. Isaiah 35 and verse 8. A highway into the kingdom. He calls it a highway which shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean shall not walk upon it. Now some calling themselves overcomers have not overcome their uncleanness. Lusts of the flesh, the carnal mind, the ways of the world. The level of faith of the world and spiritual development of the average church member. They're talking about being overcomers. And they haven't overcome their own flesh and carnal mind. Then the way of truth, Jesus points to himself as this way. 
The way into the kingdom is the way of truth. He said, I am that way which is truth. John 14, 6. And he said in John 10, those who teach their own way, and most are teaching their own way. Yes, they are. He said they're thieves and robbers. They're stealing his sheep. Well, not really his sheep, but stealing potential sheep. Remember, he said to the Pharisees, the scribes, the lawyers, you take away the key of knowledge for those who would enter in, you're preventing them. And then it's a highway of faith. This way is clearly described for us in Hebrews 11 and the many names and peoples given there who walked this way. In fact, dear friends, if you're not walking that way, you'll never make it into the kingdom. Because verse 6 of Hebrews 11 says that this is the only way that pleases God. The way of faith. He that comes to God or into God's kingdom, he said, must have faith. Now, don't make the mistake, as so many have, of limiting that to John 3.16. We got delivered out of the Bible consisting of one verse when we got the baptism. The only verse in the Bible to a non-charismatic is John 3.16. There really isn't anything else. Just read their commentaries. And I know the same experience. Just about everything is related to John 3.16. Doesn't matter what promise it is or where you find. If it's healing, it's getting your sins healed. You know, everything is dealing with sin and salvation. Now, Jesus calls the way of holiness and truth and faith the narrow way and few that find it, whereas the way into Egypt and Babylon is broad and you can find a lot of company walking on it. If you want to know the difference between the two ways, it's easy to distinguish. For example, one way is the way of the cross. If you're on that narrow way, it's hard to walk down the road because you're always having to get by somebody hanging on a cross. It's the way of the cross. The other way is of mere church membership. The easy way, sit in a pew and listen to sermons. One is the way of the denial of self the broad way is the way of self-exaltation, pride. Everywhere, on every hand, we see religious pride being manifest today in man's religious systems, charismatic, non-charismatic alike. Just to give you one example of what we mean by self-exaltation, the way that most ministers name universities, and colleges, religious schools, Bible schools, and their ministries after themselves. John Doe Evangelistic Association Incorporated, or so-and-so's university. Notice most of these ministries name them after themselves. One way is the way of the denial of self humbling of self, the other self-exaltation. These are just some things that should be obvious. One is the way of holiness. The other is the way of humanistic happiness, in which the goal of the Christian life is joy, 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 and happiness. The words of Jesus and of the New Testament is as a foreign language to the average professing Christian today. When Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn, they say, blessed are they that are happy. When the word of God says, come you out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, for what fellowship has light with darkness and righteousness with unrighteousness? They say, well, if I did that, if I took that literally, then how could I win my unsaved friends if I didn't fellowship with them and golf with them and swim with them and whatever. Well, God has a word for you, you old religious hypocrite. That's James 4. He that's a friend of the world is my enemy, says God. So you go ahead and be a friend and golf with them and say, I'm doing this to win them. I'm dating this boy because he's a nice boy and I want to win him to Christ. God's got a word for you. He that's a friend of this world is the enemy of God. James chapter 4, 1 Peter 1. Be ye holy as I am holy. 
One is the way of total commitment to absolute surrender. The other is the way of a 10% tithe on an hour in church to hear a sermon on Sunday morning. And you know as well as I do, most walk in the ways that we described as the broad way. The broad way leads to destruction. There is a narrow way and few find it. And you see, the human heart doesn't want to hear that we have to make the choice between the two ways of Psalm 1. There are two ways there, you see, depicted. Like when I was pastor of the First Baptist Church in a certain city, and they asked me if I would kindly leave, go, Amos, down to Jerusalem and preach. Don't come up here in Israel. This is the king's territory. Well, in effect, they said that. I said, leave. Why? Am I not preaching the word? Oh, no. It's the word. That's the point. It's just too strong. It's like putting salt in a wound. Did you ever get invited out for preaching the word? And that was a deacon who told me that of First Baptist Church. It's too strong, he said. Well, you see, I was under the impression that if a person was having trouble with his car, he took it to the garage, not for sympathy, but to have him tell him all the bad news, what's wrong with it and what it's going to cost to get it corrected. And I just kind of applied that principle to church. You don't come to church to get sympathy as a sinner or for your mistakes or problems. I hope not in faith assembly at least. But you're supposed to come to church to find out what's wrong. If there's something wrong and how to correct it. What is going to cost you? Everything, of course, but <laughs> you have to hear that. I thought you took your car to the garage to get it fixed. To hear what's wrong and what's it going to cost. If a woman wants to look pretty for a while, she goes to the beauty shop. But she knows she doesn't look that way. Many times at least. That's true. If she wants to really see what she looks like, she tells herself, all I have to do when I want to find out again what I really look like, I look at myself in the mirror when I get up in the morning. I'm just trying to make a point. She isn't kidding herself with all of that beauty makeup and all of that. She knows what she really looks like after, well, maybe she's gone through a trial and sweated out a fever. So you come to church to look into the mirror of God's Word so you can see yourself without the makeup, see yourself without all the pretension, see yourself without any hypocrisy, see yourself as God sees you so you can correct, see what it will cost you to do it, correct what you look like so you can begin to look more like Jesus. I thought that's why we came to church. If you want people to tell you how good you are, go to a liberal church. If you want to find out what God sees when He looks at you, come to Faith Assembly. <laughs> or a church like Faith Assembly. And you'll thank God one day that the ministry painted us all as we are, warts and all. You know, I've found that most charismatics don't know why they've received the Holy Spirit. They really do not know that it is to get us on and keep us on the pathway of holiness and total faith in God, of truth, total truth, all the truth, full gospel, and to get us off and keep us off of the road back to Egypt or the road to Babylon. That's why. Let me give you a little history before we sum up here. During the outpouring of 1900, when the latter-day outpouring of the Holy Spirit began in this 20th century, most of them came to be what we call Pentecostals today, they interpreted the purpose of this latter-day outpouring as an empowering. They said we're being empowered so that through the anointed preaching and through the manifestation of the supernatural gifts, the lost will be saved. Now, they were right, but they were not completely right. They had a part of God's purpose. Because without the supernatural signs, as we said last week, you're not going to convince anybody of anything. And that's where the church is at. Missionaries labor for years to make really no converts are very few. That's a fact that can't even be debated. If you've got a system where 100 got saved last year, 100, what's that? Well, there are about 300 saved here a few months ago. And this is a place where we teach. We're not evangelizing. We're not evangelizing in this building. You're the evangelist. But what's a hundred? 
when 30,000, 40,000 saved under one message. If a mission station saw 100 saved in a year, you'd find it on television, billboards, and everywhere. I mean, it's a big thing. Somebody said the leading evangelist, he sees like 10,000 a year saved. 10,000 a year, one sermon under anointed preaching can triple that. And it's happened time and again. You ought to read some of the history of early Pentecost. So they saw it as getting the lost saved. Praise God. They saw a part of the purpose. That was their stress, evangelism. We're empowered to evangelize. The stress in the outpouring among the denominations, which began in the 50s, was on the fact that the Holy Spirit's being poured out to renew dead church members. And then you notice how that's changed in the past decade to no longer renewal of dead church members, which ought to open their eyes why they're dead, because they're in the dead system. Now it's been changed to charismatic renewal of the system itself. And so while both Pentecostals and the early charismatics saw some of the purpose, very few people have ever seen the true purpose of the present day outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That purpose, dear friend, is to get you on and keep you on the right road. And it's the way of total faith, the crucified life, the way of holiness. To keep you off the way back to Egypt, the way back to Babylon. Early Pentecost had a part of the truth. The early outpouring in the 50s, they had a part of the truth. But because Pentecost did not stay with the faith message, and a lot of early Pentecostals had the faith message, you ought to read some of those early ministries. Tremendous things. Tremendous things took place. And there are books that will show you that, like With Signs Following, and some others. But without staying with the faith message, without staying with the full gospel, because they run to the doctors and the banks quicker than the dead system now. They don't even know how to spell faith. And I say that in love, but it's absolutely true. And they go to sleep on you on a teaching message like this if it runs over 30 minutes. And we've already gone three times that. Then they lost the anointing, the empowering. And it's not happening with them like it did. And because the denominational church, when they began to be baptized in the Spirit, didn't stay with the purpose to bring them to life. Because it didn't stay with that, because it didn't bother to study the Word to find out why God's pouring out His Spirit. You would think, by the way, let me interrupt myself, that somebody in an Episcopal church where it all started and then went all the way to Baptist, up or down, whichever way you look at it, and everything in between Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, you would think somebody in those systems would have said, why is God pouring out His Spirit in 1950s? What's this mean? They just took it, enjoyed it, like Pentecostals praised God and had their sing and praise services and prayed for the sick and they got healed because they didn't find out from the Word of God the purpose. Then they ended up in error that instead of renewing dead people, it became charismatic renewal of man's religious system. So it's Lutheran renewal. It's Presbyterian renewal. It's Catholic renewal. That's all you hear, all you read today. And so very few people have seen the total purpose. The total purpose is to empower you to walk the faith walk, the crucified life walk. To empower you to get ready in preparation for the second advent. And among the other reasons why he pours out the Spirit is to teach us how to be acceptable in his sight when we meet together, when we worship him. Like John 4.24, remember what Jesus said? He said to the Samaritan woman, the hour is coming and now is when they that worship the Father will worship him in truth. Now that's his truth, the word not man's creeds, and in spirit, in a spiritual way, in the depth of the spirit, in the elevation of the spirit. That doesn't mean just singing in tongues or praising God. That's a part of it, but truth and spirit. Because you see, Jesus said the Father is seeking such to worship him. 
And so Jesus, in saying that, is saying God is pouring out His Spirit. We apply it to our situation today, not just to get some empowered workers to go out and evangelize. Certainly, that's a part of it. But worshipers who know how to worship Him in truth and in spirit, in faith in the whole truth, the full gospel, in a spiritual manner. And getting together and shouting and praising is not necessarily a spiritual manner. That can be a part of it, but that isn't necessarily but a small part of what he means to worship in spirit. You see, if we get settled on the basic purpose of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God, he can raise up stones and empower them to do what He wants. If we get straight on why He's pouring out His Spirit, not just to empower us to evangelize, and certainly I pray God will raise up 50 evangelists if it's His will out of this body. We're all evangelists, but I'm talking about a ministry of evangelism. Praise God. But I know what He set us here for. This is a teaching ministry. But my heart still yearns to see the evangelists go out as evangelists, anointed evangelists. I mean with the gifts, word of knowledge, deliverance, the whole business. New Testament evangelism. But that isn't God's only purpose. It's not really His basic purpose. Why didn't He say that, you know, the purpose that God is primarily concerned with is evangelism? Now hear what I'm saying so you won't misinterpret. But He said He's looking for worshipers who will worship Him in truth and in spirit. And if you'll get the purpose, what God's interested in, in the right order then the evangelism, the healings, the empowerings, the renewal, whatever, will take its proper place. I'll tell you, God is not so hard up for workers that He's willing just to take people who are so indifferent and lukewarm and shallow that they haven't paid the cost of getting prepared so He could use them to fulfill His total purpose in this end time. God's not that hard up for workers. That's why I believe Jesus emphasized worship and not just workers in the kingdom. They're both important, don't misunderstand. But you see, there are multitudes of people, tens of thousands who are baptized in the Spirit and they stop with the baptism. They don't know the purpose for which they were baptized in the Spirit. We've said again and again, it isn't just to meet and praise God. Because that is an automatic result of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But what's the purpose for it? You see, because you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then Acts 1.8 is fulfilled in you, if you'll believe it. He says you're empowered. Amen. But not everybody, in fact, very few who are empowered are also qualified to fulfill Acts 1.8. It takes the preparation to qualify you. It isn't just the empowering. If it were, then the world would already be on its knees confessing Christ. The great revival of end time would have already happened. The latter day rain would already be pouring down upon us. But it's because nobody, but nobody is preparing themselves. Outside this ministry and a few others, tell me somebody that's preparing people with a full gospel. Why, if they start what they call a Bible school, they start right in with the old institutional methods and ways and ideas and beliefs. So God is not so hard up for workers that He just has to take anybody whether or not they have qualified themselves. I've ministered to, prayed for, a lot of people, some of the ministers who were empowered. But I'll say it, I've met very few people who were qualified. Qualified to do what God is pouring out His Spirit upon us to accomplish. I've seen people write in Faith Assembly, going back to 1966, who were empowered. God empowered right in our church. Received the baptism, but they weren't qualified because they rushed off in this direction or that direction going to establish their own religious, you know, system, build or make their own golden calf. And some of those, you see, because they didn't tarry for the vision to be fulfilled, couldn't wait, couldn't sit under the discipline of preparation, 
And by the way, some who were even on automatic tape list have canceled off of that. You know, they feel like, well, I've got enough now and I don't have to listen to anybody else. But that isn't the point. Because God is going to do something through faith assembly. And if you were ever a part of it, if you were really a part of it, you would still stay a part of it some way. But they've rushed off. And some of them have gotten into the institutional ways and habits and practices again. Everything from thinking they got to have the Sunday school, which, dear friends, we don't have time to digress on that one. That isn't in the Word of God. That was established in the 18th century by a man to teach people how to read and write, and he taught them out of the Bible. Anyway, they've established these methods that the institutional system is using in order to attract people. That's what I'm saying. However a child hears about the gospel, praise the Lord. We don't want to get into that. We've already dealt with it. Can I just put a period there by saying their instruction is supposed to be in the home? Amen. Not with somebody with a quarterly in their hand and on Easter, having the children show their Easter bonnets and their dresses and their new suits and on Christmas tell what Santa Claus brought you and all that. Well, anyway, the teaching for the child is to be in the home and in the church. He's to be brought up at the feet of Jesus in the church. They understand far more than you think. But anyway, they've gotten off into those practices. They've joined the ministerial clubs in their area. You know what they are? The ministerial associations made up of charismatics, non-charismatics, liberals, and you name it, in order to be accepted in the community. I'm thinking of things that have happened. I've had people come and say they've lost the anointing. Say that in effect. We're not getting fed. He's charismatic, but we're not getting fed. So God has put us in faith assembly. Some who've gotten off into error. Some who've lost their faith. You know, so many people, it seems, and I trust you're not going to be one of them, are like the horse. I don't have anything against horses. I like horses. But horses are not the smartest animals on the earth. Dogs and cats have it all over horses. I'm trying to make a point, though. I like horses. I really do. But so many people are like the horse. If the barn catches on fire, you can bring the horse out. And if you don't hold him and tie him up, a lot of times he'll break loose and run right back into the burning barn and perish. That's what a lot of people have. Horse sense. <laughs> God brings them out of Egypt. And they can't wait to sign up to go back into bondage in Babylon of some form. Is God talking to you? He's warning you through these admonitions for endurance. It does grieve your heart to say that no, some don't receive it. But thank God, I believe the majority do. Father, in Jesus' name, may every heart be open to the truth, whatever the cost, personal cost is, that they will gladly pay it that they will be on guard day to day, week to week, as they wait for the fulfillment of your word and promises, be on guard against going back to Egypt or into Babylon, or making their own golden calves to sing and dance and bow down to. Impress upon all our hearts the urgency of not forgetting this message, because it will be for the time when things get harder and rougher. And some have already gone back to Egypt or into Babylon or made their own calves. Some out of this body have raised up golden calves and people began to bow down before them and have followed them out of faith assembly. Oh, Father, we pray that that will not be true of anyone from this moment on in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.